Welcome everyone. Hello. Happy World IP Day. And I'm so excited for this incredible program. And I would love to introduce our Executive Director, Joan Toth. Thanks, Monica. Uh, welcome, everyone. Delighted to have you participate in World IP Day with us today. Uh, we have a stellar panel uh, to chat with us about uh, the uh, International IP Day theme, uh, which is centers around women and innovation. And uh, our speakers today certainly are uh, experts and leaders in, uh, in the field and will give us a great perspective on what is happening uh, in uh, the world of IP. And uh, without further ado, I'll uh, turn it back to Monica to welcome them. Thanks, Joan. I'm going to introduce our moderator, Noreen Kral, who is a co-founder of CHIPS, and we're so lucky to get to work with her. Uh, she serves on the board of the National Inventors Hall of Fame. She's a legal executive specializing in technology law and intellectual property. She's the former vice president and chief litigation counsel for Apple, where she was responsible for all aspects of Apple's global commercial and intellectual property litigation. Before Apple, she was the vice president and chief IP counsel for Sun Microsystems, and she started her career as an engineer at IBM, where she worked for 12 years and held various positions in both the engineering and legal departments. She earned her bachelor's degree in electrical engineering, master's degree in computer science, and her Juris Doctor. And she's received numerous accolades, recognizing her incredible work, including the YWCA Tribute to Women Award, one of the 50 most influential people in IP, and one of the top 100 in-house counsel. She's the only, she was the only woman named to the first list of top 40 IP market makers by the Global IAM Group in 2014, and also was named as one of the top 50 women in tech law um, for three years in a row. Uh, so welcome, Noreen. Thank you for bringing us together. Well, thank you, uh, Monica, and welcome everybody uh, to this event. Um, Chips is absolutely delighted to host this event celebrating World IP Day. Um, as you know, the theme for 2023 is Women in IP Accelerating Innovation and Creativity. And this is a perfect topic for CHIPS, which is an organization founded in 2004, focused on advancing women in technology, law, and policy. Um, we are absolutely um, delighted to be joined today by an incredibly prestigious um, group of women in the IP industry. And we're going to celebrate the achievements and contributions of women in IP, and also how we might further uh, advance and support women in this space. Um, so let me just uh, introduce the, very briefly, I know the bios were circulated and um, the, uh, the invitation. Um, so I'm gonna be very brief on, on the, the, the introductions here so we can get to the conversation. Um, first, uh, we're absolutely delighted to have Director Vidal with us today. As you know, um, Director Vidal is the director of the United States Patent and Trademark Office, which is one of the largest patent and trademark offices in the world. In this capacity, Director Vidal is the principal IP advisor to the president on incentivizing and protecting US innovation, entrepreneurship, and creativity. Uh, Director Vidal also has a bachelor's and master's in uh, electrical engineering. And um, she started her career as an engineer at GE and Lockheed Martin before embarking on an incredibly um, successful and prestigious legal career. Uh, also joining us today is Dr. Ruthie Lyle, who is a PhD in EE, and she is the principal architect and uh, technical architect um, at NVIDIA and has an extensive experience in the patenting world. She's, Dr. Lyle has over 20 years of industry, academic, and R&D um, leadership experience. And more importantly for the, the conversation today, Director Lyle has over 220 issued US patents, which is among the most for an African-American woman. Uh, she's a registered patent agent and previously an IBM Master Inventor Emeritus. 
And she started her career at IBM um, and was there for over 14 years. And um, last we have Lisa C. Pat DeLuca, who has BS and an MS in uh, the various uh, computer science fields. She is the senior director at Unstoppable Domains, and she has over 20 years experience in the industry in computer systems and is focused now in decentralized web and web three technologies. Lisa has over 650 issued US patents and has uh, over a thousand filed in the US and abroad. I think she's actually lost count. There's just so many um, that she has to uh, to her, you know, her credit. Uh, she previously was a distinguished engineer and director of product management at IBM, um, where she was over, she was an IBMer for over 16 years. I think she was the first woman to hit the 100 um, patent plateau award within the company. Um, and just as a fun fact, uh, it's interesting that both um, Dr. Lyle, uh, Lisa, and I all started our careers at IBM in various capacities in engineering and in the IP organization. So um, we have that commonality uh, behind us. Given the theme of the event today, we thought it would be really um, important to start the conversation talking about women in inventorship and um, you know how we might advance the participation and, and increase the participation um, of women in the inventorship um, areas. So before we kick this off, I thought I'd start with a few stats that um, I think uh, would be really interesting for uh, the participants to hear. Uh, various reports put the female participation rate anywhere between 12 and no higher than 20 percent um, in the, the patenting process. Uh, a WIPO 2021 report had 16% inventors on international patent applications were women. An EPO report on November 22nd found that there was fewer than one in seven inventors in Europe, which were women. Um, and then there's been USPTO reports, uh, hopefully Director Vidal can you know, have a little bit more data on this than maybe I do at this moment, but the most recent report in 2020, the data showed a 12 to 13% of women inventor rate and 16 to 17% women were named on issued patents. WIPO estimates that at the current pace, the gender parity among PCT listed inventors will only be reached by 2058. Uh, some fields are, you know, um, have a greater share of women inventors. An EPO study found that women um, in the field of chemistry had the biggest share of women inventors, and also universities were um, had a higher inventor rate than in the uh, private business. Many blame the shortage um, of women inventor and inventorship on a lack of women in STEM, um, and yet at the same time, women. Um, in STEM careers in science and engineering and tech are really being encouraged uh, and supported across industries, whether it's in big tech or it's in startups, but there's still few women participating in the, the, the IP system. So really the question is, what can we do to improve these statistics and really advance the, the, the participation of women um, in technological areas. So uh, I'm gonna start with the first question to doc, uh, Director Bedell and ask if uh, Director Bedell can perhaps give us a brief update on what's the latest at the patent office and maybe discuss some of the, the patent USPTO stats on um, women um, inventorship. And I believe it's trending in, in a positive direction, but perhaps if there's more um, that could be done and uh, I'll turn it over to Director Bedell. Thank you, that, thank you for that, Noreen. And I'm, I'm humbled to be here with two of our biggest customers. So thank you, Ruthie and Lisa. <laughs> um, phenomenal work that you've done. And, and as I, I met with uh, Ruthie last weekend in Tennessee and I asked her how many patents does she have with my name on it? So <laughs> you've, got something new to, you've got something new to aspire to. Um, so excited to be here. So excited that the CHIPS community is asking that question, Noreen, as, in terms of what can we do about this? Because as, as I tell people, it's not just the USPTO. We all have to work together if we're really going to make a difference. So um, I will give you a little bit of information on the statistics. Um, trending, I would use that term extremely loosely. Um, if it's trending, it's just percentage points that are very uh, you know, 
portions of a percentage point, not entire percentage points. Um, we did produce a study recently on women in patenting and where women patent. Uh, there was some great data in that, including that we saw a 32% increase in the number of US counties where women patented between 1990 and 2019. We also, I'm gonna quote a couple statistics from a couple regions of the country. So in Silicon Valley, we saw the largest growth of rate of women inventor patentees, and it was in electricity in Santa Clara County, California. There was an increase by 7,000% um, from women patenting over that 30 year period. In 1990, there were only 46 women inventors that were listed for electricity. By 2019, there were, uh, there were nearly 3,300. Um, another county that had a huge boost was Harris County in Texas, uh, where there was a 2,045% growth of women patentees in the field of fixed construction. Now, you would think that with that data, which our, our report is online, anybody can access it, you would think with that data, things are looking good, the, the percentages are increasing, but that's not giving you the parity numbers. That's not telling you, are women becoming more at parity with men when it comes to patenting? We have not seen a large jump when it comes to that. That The numbers you quote, the number of US inventors on patents that are women, the percentage is between 12 and 13%. That's been pretty consistent. Uh, the 20% relates more to the number of US patents that contain women inventors. So it's a little bit of a different statistic. Um, I will say one thing that gives me hope, and I'll quote these statistics and then tell you a few of the things that we're doing, is that when we get out and meet women where they are with our pro bono services, when we meet everybody where they are with our pro bono services, those numbers change dramatically. So we know that there are women innovators everywhere. We know that there are uh, innovators of color everywhere. So when we get out and meet, and I'll just focus on the, on the female statistic, when we get out and meet women where they are, 43% of those who use our services identify as women. So that's a jump from 12 to 13% to 43%. So what are we doing about it? Um, we have our Council for Inclusive Innovation. We are working with that council to ensure that we, we reach more innovators throughout the entire country. We want to reach them when, when they're young. So last year alone, we educated 280,000 children on innovation and entrepreneurship through Camp Invention. These are seven, eight, nine-year-olds up to 12th grade. You know, at the end of a week, these nine-year-olds are asking questions like, how can I protect my merch on the internet? So we're trying to reach, we're trying to reach them early, and, and, um, but then also often. So we have teach the teacher programs. We're trying to introduce training in schools. We're working closely with HBCUs, with MSIs. Um, really wanna make sure we're out there reaching everybody where they are. And I just finished a women entrepreneurship event moments ago where we talked about women entrepreneurs and how we can better support them. So that, that's an initiative that I founded with the Secretary of Commerce. It focuses on women. It's inclusive, not exclusive. There's always a number of men who attend and we're trying to connect women up with all the resources that they need. We're not trying to reinvent things. We're trying to be a catalyst to bring all the great organizations together and work on how can we solve for this? How can we, we be a one-stop shop for resources and make sure that women and everybody knows what's out there and how we can connect them? So I could go on and on about all the, all the work that we're doing. Um, I will pause there, but just know that government is here for you and we're working really hard to see you on your journey. Well, well, thank you for that, Director Vidal. A follow-up question. I saw on LinkedIn um, earlier in the week that you were uh, contemplating some sort of, you know, email or outreach to innovators. Could you maybe talk a little bit more about that initiative? Uh, and yeah, again, that, you know, how we could, how this organization and community can amplify your messages. That, that would be fantastic, Noreen. So uh, this came out of a discussion that I had at Kiowa Island about a week and a half ago. Uh, maybe two weeks ago, where I was on a panel with a venture capitalist. And the venture capitalist was asked the question first, which was, what can government do for you? And he essentially said, get out of our way. And I thought, you do not know your government. Um, and then by the time we finished the panel, he just said, I had no idea what the government was doing for me. Because I spoke not only about everything the USPTO is doing, but everything we're doing as the Department of Commerce, all the funding opportunities, all the communities we're trying to build, the tech hubs we're gonna stand up. There's so much that we're doing um, with MBDA, Minority Business Development Agency, you know, across government, we are keenly focused on bringing more people into the innovation and entrepreneurship ecosystem. 
and having them contribute in a way that's going to increase all of our economic prosperity, et cetera. I mean, I love, I love the theme of today. It's accelerating innovation and, and creativity. You don't accelerate it if half the people are on the bench. When I spoke at EarthX last week, I said, basically, if, if you were in a classroom and somebody just counted one, two, one, two, and said, all those with the number two, leave the room, you're going to sit on the sidelines. That's essentially what we've done. We need, to, we need to rectify that and bring more people in. So to, the, to my LinkedIn post, what I really want to do is make sure people know about everything that we're offering. And we put it on our channels. But as I said, even when I took office, that we're in somewhat of an echo chamber. Like not everybody in the country is watching the USPTO channel. So we need to figure out what kind of partnerships we can um, enter into, how we can get influencers to be talking about this so that women across our entire country and rural communities, those are, uh, who are under-resourced, those who are in the military, they all know what government is doing for them. And they use us, they use our resources to create jobs, to create innovations. Um, so that's really what we're targeted at. And if it means me writing letters to inventor groups or anybody who wants to hear from me directly, I will, I will do that. And I've started doing that, uh, just build it. And if people come, great, we'll, we'll keep it going. But I, I'm piloting that now. And if there's a way I could build out that list, uh, we have a, a list for we, I'm gonna send the same information to them just to let people know about all the great offerings we have, they're all free. So every, uh, every great offering we have, so more people can benefit it, from it and we can accelerate innovation and creativity. That sounds terrific. And CHIPS will do anything it can to help amplify the PTO channel. Um, let me uh, switch over to um, Dr. Lyle. And let, you are simply an inspiring, um, both from your patenting experience as well as your engineering experience and have really have an incredible, you know, contribution to the world of uh, IP and innovation. Could you talk a little bit about, you know, your IP journey from maybe starting as an individual contributor and moving up into, you know, IP leadership, talk a little bit maybe about your experiences on invention review committees and strategies and what, what's the secret behind your success as an inventor? Oh, wow. It's a lot of questions. Well, first, I want to say thank you uh, for allowing me an opportunity to participate today. I really have a passion for this space, as you can tell, and also for diversity and inventorship. My motivation today is really to build awareness and to let people know that it's not a deep, mystical thing that's not something that they can accomplish. My other motivation is is we have so many problems and we need all minds on deck to solve them because they're not problems for particular groups of people, but for the human species. If we don't fix these problems, we may not persist. So I say, let's get everyone involved. Um, my journey in this space started because when I, when I left graduate school, I wasn't sure if I was gonna go into industry or become a faculty member. So I went to an NSF early career faculty program at the University of Wisconsin. I met a woman, uh, Jennifer Trelowitz. She's a CEO and founder of Felix. And at the time she was still finishing her PhD. She came to IBM in 2001 and she reached out to me and said, Ruthie, you know about electromagnetics. Can you help me? I need to draw some paper and I want you to help me with this patent. And really I had no awareness before that. So for me, I think for like many women, it comes with someone inviting them to participate. Um, along the way uh, at IBM, I did really interesting and great things, but I didn't publish as much as I would have liked to. I was still an academic at heart, uh, pretty young in. And patents was a way for me to stay current on emerging technologies and also to build my network within the company. So I started by just submitting ideas and then uh, I was invited to be on a board, um, which I thought was strange because I was the only, well, the, the board had a lot of more mature people. And I felt like, I don't know if I can judge IP, but that was the beginning for me. And over time, I, you know, at IBM, you know, I was, I served on boards, I actually led a patent review board. I worked in IP and licensing, which is a corporate function that makes money on the portfolio. 
uh, did all those things. I took the patent bar, became a patent agent so I can understand the process. And even more, more so, and, and Lisa may mention this when, when she gets a chance to share, but work within the company to help other women come along behind me. I think one of the best things I think of when I think of my time at IBM was that I was able to help at least two other women make IBM Master Inventor. I was able to help, you know, support a program that was trying to build awareness and to help people understand the process. And for that, I, I take great pride. And I think that it, it helped me in my career because today uh, I joined NVIDIA. And by the way, all my comments are my own and not my employers. Uh, I joined NVIDIA and I have the awesome, awesome opportunity to work with world leaders. Uh, in machine learning and artificial intelligence, both on the hardware and the software side. Uh, being, being able to do just like the dream job for me, I couldn't have imagined this. When I started, uh, two, 2001 was my first issue patent. When I started back then, I couldn't have imagined it. So I want, like I said, build awareness and to encourage ladies on this call or anyone who may hear this presentation later to go find out about it make use of the services that Kathy mentioned that are free uh, and build your knowledge. It's an enjoyable thing if you like to solve problems, which most engineers do. I think you'd like to participate in the patent process. Thank you, thank you for that. Um, over to Lisa, wow, 650 issued patents, at least that you're aware of, maybe more over a thousand files. You must be one of the most prolific female inventors in the world at that rate. Um, truly impressive. Would you be willing to share um, with the uh, participants here today what the story behind your successes in both innovation, inventorship, and leadership? Yeah, um, I, I guess if it comes down to one word, it's curiosity, right? As a kid, my parents always encouraged us to use our imagination, play with the things around us and imagine what was possible. And it was never a question of like, can I do it? <laughs> like I, I wasn't good enough or anything like that. It was really more about um, let's go explore, let's learn new things. And similar to Ruthie, when I joined IBM, it was, oh, other people around me, they have patent awards. What is this thing? And then the more questions I asked and more I learned about the program, I'm like, all right, let's submit some ideas through the process and see what happens. It's kind of one of those um, fail fast mentalities, right? With anything, even product launches, it's let's get something out the door and see what sticks. And um, the beauty of being a prolific inventor is there's never, it's never your baby, right? So if someone doesn't like that one idea, it's okay, move on, find ways to make it even better and then come up with even stronger IP in the end. And to Ruthie's point, it's also networking. Ruthie and I are co-inventors. I was going to go look and see what all of our inventors mentions are that we submitted together, yes. but <laughs> it's just such a great way to meet other people and find other, you know, ways to challenge yourself mentally. It's, it's a lot of fun. Oh, thank you for that. I guess a question for both of you, um, Dr. Lyle and, and Lisa, is um, another challenge that we see is the advancement in you know, women succeeding in tech and uh, the tech industry in general and breaking into leadership roles in, in various organizations. Do you think that there's um, a trade-off uh, for you know, becoming successful you know, and moving up into, you know, um, you know, senior director or VP roles where you're managing functions. Is there a trade-off between that um, success and participating in the inventoring and the innovation process? Because you're at some point then you're, you're managing an organization or a function and you're less hands-on on the day-to-day -day development activities. And I'm, I'm curious, I know Director Vidal started with a, a an, a positive stat about the increase of um, uh, women inventors in, you know, in the Silicon Valley and Santa Clara Valley area, but um, I'm just curious if this is something you see and something we should be aware of because we want to do both. We want to advance women's careers and we want to increase the participation in the invention process. Yeah, I can jump in first. Um, 
No, right? We all still have 24 hours in a day. It's always going to be a lack of time to do anything. So it comes down to what do you prioritize as an individual? What do you want to see move forward? And with me growing, now I run all of engineering product and design at our startup. And it opens up a lot of opportunities for me to explore other spaces and influence all these teams that otherwise as an IC, you're kind of focused in your own little part of the company. So for me, it's been more of an opportunity and it's also to Ruthie's point, more of that, how do you mentor and inspire other people, teach them how to go and create patents and file them versus do it all yourself. Yeah, I agree with Lisa. And if I remember, Lisa, you have two sets of twins, right? I do, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So she doesn't just run organization, she has a, a family. Hope you don't mind me sharing that. Um, I agree. I feel like when I when I think of people who have done well in terms of leading organizations and growing their career, Marion Croak comes to mind. Uh, I think she's still a vice president at Google, and she's a phenomenal inventor, and she has done so much work in both worlds. And so she just demonstrates that you just have to have a good balance, uh, mixing innovation in what you do. So I'm part of a group, the US IPA, which is looking at diversity and inventorship across the board. And what we do find is sometimes when people are in roles that are not as inventive, it's, it may be more difficult for them to, to uh, invent. Because sometimes, I think in the ver very early stages, you're inspired by something that you're working on. Someone tells you about the process and you go do it. I think once you once you've matured in the process, no matter what job you're in, you you always see problems like oh, that could be done better. I learned about this and why can't we do it this way? We would improve it so much. So um, I think it's possible, but I think you just have to have a good balance. Uh, well, first of all, congratulations on being co-inventors uh, on a patent. I think that that's fantastic. I wasn't aware of that. And uh, Lisa, two sets of twins. Oh, my God, that's probably the most efficient approach to uh, parenthood that, that I've heard of in a long time. So. <laughs> yeah. <Yes. laughs> Yeah. Well, so this is World IP Day, and, and I'd like to just broaden the discussion a little bit. Yeah, I know from my, my career in, um, you know, IP enforcement and, and acting on the global stage, um, it's, it's a daunting process. And, you know, trying to understand, um, you know, the different patent laws, the different patent agencies, the different, you know, um, patent procedures, um, it, it, it can be incredibly daunting. So I'd like to switch over to uh, Dr. Director Vidal and see what the Patent Office and the USPTO is doing and coordinating on, on the international stage. Thank you for that. So um, it's interesting because when I came into office, I thought I was going to be unique and really thinking about trying to expand the innovation ecosystem and focus on bringing more people from across the country into it. And as I've learned, all the countries are thinking about this. So there is a big focus right now internationally on small to medium sized enterprises. I think everybody has recognized that that really is the key to economic prosperity and global competitiveness. And so at our event in November with Europe and Japan, that was the entire focus was small to medium sized enterprises. How do we reduce barriers to all? What does that look like? What should, what can we share across our countries in terms of what's working? So, um, and it's been a continual discussion that I've had uh, with many countries. So um, what we're doing is we're analyzing our systems. We're trying to find out ways that we can create um, the ability to use the work product from the other countries, the ability to do things so you don't have to um, go to each individual country. And as you know, Noreen, there's many processes that exist already. Um, we're doing, we're trying to expand those relationships, whether it's our patent prosecution highway, where we can use the, the prior art found in a different country on a related application, um, or whether it's just trying to knock down some of these barriers so that people can, can access the entire ecosystem. I will say that the, our attache program is phenomenal and everybody should know about that because we have people on the ground throughout the world that work for the USPTO and their job is to help you. Their job is to help you navigate the individual country, um, to think about you know, how you should be thinking about IP, how you protect your IP in those countries. And no matter where I go and talk to stakeholders, the one thing everybody can agree on is 
the IP caches are incredible. So please know they're available. You can find them on our website. Uh, Nathania, who's also incredible, who's on here, may, may be able to give you a link to that. Um, but, but, but that's been phenomenal. And then we've got a Global Intellectual Property Academy that we run. That's a great place to sign up for courses, learn more about what's going on. Um, and we're also working across other countries when it comes to women in particular. So for Women's International Women's Day, we hosted the first ever multilateral summit uh, with other countries to talk about women and mentoring and how we can better support women. And 35 IP offices attended. It was, it was phenomenal. We had it right here at the USPTO. So I would just say across the board, we know that IP is not just a national thing. We know that we need to support women. Um, we need to support people in rural communities, people of color, people in the military. We're looking at this very broadly, that we want to be there to support everyone, to make sure that they fully understand what it means to um, protect their IP and what they need to do to do so. And I will say, we, we just, as I mentioned, we just hosted a women entrepreneurship event, um, you know, now probably an hour and a half ago. And one of the things that was mentioned is people don't realize that if you sell your goods on the internet, you're now in global commerce, that, that you've now entered global commerce and everybody who, or most everybody who started a job or a company um, during COVID, they all started selling on the, selling on the internet. So, um, so it's really important work and we're doing it not just in the US, but, but with all of our ally countries across the globe. That's terrific. You know, the, the, the process itself can be, you know, kind of daunting, you know, anything, um, you know, that can be done to streamline on the, the, the U.S. level as well as the international level um, for potential entrepreneurs uh, would, I think, be greatly, greatly um, appreciated. Sure. Yeah, and if you don't mind, Noreen, I'd love to just mention yeah. something that we've done internal to the U.S., and that's we just launched our first expedited examination for those who are new to patenting who are under-resourced. So that's a good opportunity to get some initial feedback more quickly on what you're trying to patent and then potentially get your patent more quickly so that you can use it to start a business. Well, that's fantastic. That really does help, um, you know, encourage inventors to pursue, um, you know, patents and protecting their innovation. Um, over to Dr. Lyle. We have on this call, this is a CHIPS uh, organization that, again, is, is focused on, you know, advancing women in technology law and policy, thousands of members around the globe. Um, and in your capacity as, um, you know, an, an IP strategist, whether it be on the licensing side, the enforcement side, or the protection side, uh, I'd be curious if you have thoughts on best practices. Most of the people on this call are IP professionals. Um, that's a, a big part of our, our community, uh, whether it be uh, engineers, whether it be um, lawyers, whether it be people in, in government, uh, even in the judiciary. But I'd be curious if you have thoughts on, you know, best practices, what works, what has been really helpful for you as an inventor? Uh, and, and what could be better if, you know, for example, don't send me a document at 10 o'clock at night and ask me for feedback at eight by eight the next morning. But I, I'll hand it over to you. And, you know, I'd love to hear your firsthand experience. And I think the participants on the call would love to hear that as well. So I would say a strong partnership. When you work with anyone to protect an idea, really understand their business understand how they're gonna use this asset, why are they getting it, how does it provide value? And that will help you as you write claims. You know, it's very, you can write claims and get something through, but will this really bring value to the person who's employing you to do it? So I think really understanding the business and a strong partnership. Uh, depending if you, when you work with leading edge companies, um, be a little bit patient with inventors uh, when they're pushing something out the door, technology, and they're trying to get it out. They may be delayed in getting back to you. So give them a little bit of grace. Uh, I've learned being in my current employer, these people are like super busy and they want to get, turn things around quickly and may not just because they're overloaded. I'm not sure exactly how to fix this, but make sure your firm has diverse representation. 
Uh, it allows for different perspectives and it helps you to connect with the client. And those would be the things that come to mind quickly. Thank you. I know diversity in, um, in legal representation is also, um, you know, a hot button item as well. I know, um, you know, in my professional career, this is something we repeatedly were asking for our law firm and law firms, and, and a lot of it really gets to developing a pipeline, um, you know, especially of diverse, you know, candidates um, from, you know, junior high level. Get them interested in innovation and intellectual property, potential careers in, in law, um, and, and you know if they can see it, they can be it. I, I I absolutely agree with you, and I think that you know even in my case, I didn't know I could be a patent agent if I had a, a engineering background, and so it propelled me into a whole new space that I couldn't have even imagined. So like when we started today's call, I was like, this is all about building awareness. Um, when I lay this mantle down and this, you know, my time and I want someone to come behind me, I don't want to be the only one. I want to see others. And so like, if there's anything I can do, like I, I talk at schools and different places, of course, you know, I talk to my own son and his friends to just to try to encourage him because it's like, when you were describing what you, you've you done in your career and where you are now, it's an inspiration even to me. So thanks. I, I had a similar experience. I, you know, was contemplating getting a PhD and I had a fantastic uh, supervisor at IBM who encouraged me to join the patent review committee, which embarked me on my, my career in intellectual property. Um, all right. Well, over to Lisa. Wow. Your career is taking you from working for IBM, which is kind of like working for the government, to running a startup. Uh, and I understand that you, beyond patenting, you recently uh, filed for trademark and you're doing work in uh, decentralization uh, and Web3 uh, technologies. Talk to us a little bit about what it's like to make that transition from you know, a big IP shop to a startup. And, um, you know, what, what thoughts do you have on how, you know, the PTO could be even more uh, transparent about um, IP creators and, and any thoughts you have for the, or the participants on this call as well, well as Director Vidal while we have her on the, the call with us here today. How much time do we have? <laughs> <laughs> I, have I have lots of good ideas. Well, let's see. Starting from big enterprise tech to startup, it's a whole new world. It's a ton of fun. I think that I was lucky going to big enterprise with IBM because they just ingrained that culture of innovation. It was everywhere you looked. It was just almost an assumption that you were going to be an inventor. You're going to at least have that inventor mindset when you approached the products that you were working on. Now, going to the startup world, it's, it's not necessarily there, right? You're thinking about how do you launch a product, move quickly, but not necessarily about IP, especially in the Web3 space, which is very open source, community driven, not necessarily let's protect our ideas with patents. Um, but because I came from big enterprise tech, I was able to use that learning in the startup and we filed patents. It, I, I mean, not as many as uh, IBM, but at least once a month we're filing patents and starting to protect all the innovations that our team is moving forward with. So I think that once you learn, it just becomes easy. It's an afterthought as far as like, how do you protect what you're doing? Um, and then everything that you're creating is valuable and just adds value to the, the startup, right? Like our investors are excited. Everyone's seeing that we're innovating and it just makes the value go significantly up compared to if we hadn't had patents. Um, as far as like opportunities to improve, I do think that the USPTO could uh, jump into some of the decentralized technology and especially around NFTs. Um, here, I'm gonna, I'm gonna share my screen because that's fun, let's make this engaging. But um, so in this case, everyone has a digital identity and you probably heard about the board apes and kind of like the it, six figure NFTs that people are buying, but really what these are is like proof that you own or you participated in some sort of event. So it'd be really cool as inventors to have some sort of award or badge that says, hey, I'm an inventor and then be able to see how many there are so as part of a recent keynote I did, I, um, 
I started an NFT collection that's just like a proof of attendance. So if you were at one of my keynotes, you got to have an NFT. In this case, it was for USAA. So this was their mascot. But you can imagine that you can have multiple kind of badges. So you can have 11 badges. So now I have 11 patents. And this might help to bring awareness to other inventors out there. So I could go find the Ruthies of the world and say, hey, I see you're inventing in the space and this technology that I'm interested in. Um, what do you think of this idea? Or do you want to be a co-inventor on something? Let's brainstorm what new ideas could come out of it. So there's tons to do um, so much. There's always room to innovate and come up with new ideas with every new technology that comes out there. There's just more problems to solve. Well, from the chat, it sounds like your ideas are a hit um, as far as the badges go. And, you know, I'd, I'd say from my experience, individual individual inventors, um, you know, sole inventors is are, are you know, uh, in one category as far as, you know, getting th their patents. When you are in a um, organization, typically your patents uh, are owned by the, um, the entity, the company that you're working for. So you actually never even see that red ribbon patent that, you know, comes to the company and it ends up in, you know, some kind of a safe somewhere, a fireproof safe. And, you know, it comes out only if you need to use it in either licensing or litigation. So I love the idea, you know, of a badge um, where you, you have that opportunity to put that into your profile. Um, and the same for individual inventors, they get the ribbon patent, so they at least have that in you know, their hands to, um, to be proud of uh, their accomplishments. But you know, I think the badge idea is, is terrific for everybody. Um, yeah, and just to add to that, the patent I learned the most from was when I was a pro se inventor. And I wrote the whole thing up myself. It's like when you're part of a big company, there it's a black box. You've got an attorney that's writing it all up and you don't really understand what goes into it. But by going through the process yourself, you hear, you learn about office actions and you learn that you can talk to your examiner and you learn like what it takes to come up with the figures and the claims and little things that make me a better inventor now that I've gone through it as more of the flip side of the coin. Um, so I'd encourage everyone to try it. You, I mean, it's so cheap. <laughs> Be a pro se inventor, go try it out yourself and then uh, make some mistakes. That, that, that's terrific. I, Director Vidal, in the beginning, you, you mentioned there was a streamlined process for sole inventors. Is that, does that capture somewhat of uh, what Lisa is talking about here? So I would say two things. One, there's going to be a stream, well, there is a streamlined process for getting your patent where you can get it more quickly if you're a first time filer and under resourced. But regardless of whether you're a first time filer or under resourced, we have a whole pro se unit that helps pro se inventors. So they're standing by to help. They can help you through the process. They can answer additional questions. Um, and then we also have pro bono organizations throughout the entire country, not only in law schools, but we have teamed with 21 organizations that cover the entire country. Uh, you can go there for help. Uh, one more thing, and this is the kind of stuff I will be putting in my emails. We also have patent and trademark resource centers in libraries across the entire country. So there's, there's so much out there to help you on your journey. Oh, that's 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 incredible. It's helpful. Um, that, again, it's again something else that chips can help get the word out about, about like the pro bono and the libraries, um, because I wasn't aware. I, I personally wasn't aware of the pro bono organization. And I know from my own practice that I would get people reaching out to me like, hey, I have an idea. I'm like, I work for Apple, you know, or I work for IBM. <laughs> yeah. I can't write a patent, sorry. But to be able to point them somewhere else uh, to a resource that they can avail themselves upon. Um, over to Ruthie. Any, any, as a um, a large client of the United States Patent and Trademark Office, any thoughts that you have um, for you know the this the folks on this call, the participants in this meeting, or director of it all on, you know, your experiences and, you know, what worked and what, what was um, maybe a little bit more challenging or daunting to, you know, figure out and overcome. So I think once I uh, became a patent agent, I understood the process a lot better and that was quite helpful. And so maybe not everyone can do that, um, but as much as possible when you're working with the inventor, keep them in the loop of what's happening, where you are in the process and the, the types of things you're doing to make sure that their idea is captured correctly and make 
it to the finish line of being issued. Um, to Director Vidal, all I would say is this is a woman on the move who has a heart for the people. And you know, because she's everywhere and doing it. And just, just you know, want to say thank you um, because your presence alone is an inspiration to so many people. They see you in the office, and that my only comment would be, keep it going, keep it going. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. <laughs> oh, I love that. Uh, for folks that might not be aware. Uh, Director Vidal was one of the uh, earliest uh, outside counsel supporter of CHIPS and really has been um, instrumental in, in many of our programs. I think the one that um, the largest one that comes to mind is uh, Next Gen Lawyers and really helping us spearhead the opportunity um, for you know women and underrepresented minorities to get the opportunity to stand up in, in court. Um, in you know a, a, a safe environment and a supported environment, and that program has been largely adopted across the federal judiciary um, in the United States. And most recently, the lead of our UK chapter, um, Ansley Ward, was capable was able to take that concept and bring it to um, the UK legal system. And that's just been recent in the last couple of months. So you know, Kathy's inspiration and, and work and energy is really gone a long way um, over all of, you know, the years of her career. So thank you for that, Kathy. Thank you, Noreen. <laughs> in, in our remaining time, this question is really um, to, to all of the panelists. Um, really, uh, what thoughts do you have, again, knowing, you know, the folks that are on this call, uh, what, what ideas and thoughts do you have on engaging, you know, women in the innovation pipeline, whether it be you know, in your own careers, your coworkers, um, maybe advice to, you know, friends and family or, you know, colleagues or, or even clients, um, what, what advice that uh, folks on this call might be giving to clients to um, get them engaged in the process and help them and, you know, give them inspiration and point them to resources. Uh, and I'll start with you, Dr. Lyle. Okay, so thanks. Um, I would say we're on the cusp of change. Just this panel alone shows what's possible. So let's go out and build awareness, make sure people are aware that this exists. Let's help them understand how this uh, um, associates with business. You know, we, we talk a lot about patents, but patents are a key indicator of innovation. When analysts look at a business or a new entity, they are definitely looking at the patent portfolio. So there's value in that. Um, I heard about the programs at the HBCUs and things like that. I think we should put effort behind those, support those for our next uh, group of people coming along. Um, but if we walk away from this meeting with anything, one thing I want to leave is that it is possible. The problems we have call for all people engaging together in a collaborative effort to solve these problems. We want to do so many things, and it starts with being able to at least have a momentary monopoly on the idea that can do many things beyond just say I'm a inventor. It can build wealth. It can do a lot of things. So let's just work together in events like these and beyond this as a team. Thank you. Well, thank you. I, I, I agree with you on especially um, educating and building the pipeline and starting as early as we possibly can. Um, you know, CHIPS has a, an Ali program where in, you know, the, the summer we take young high school and junior high uh, students to uh, the judiciary to see uh, women on the bench. Uh, we take them to the US PTO satellites to see women um, patent uh, uh, agents and um, we take them to tech organizations and they can see women um, in leaderships and in, in program and product management. So, you know, those are some things that other, um, you know, CHIPS chapters could consider doing um, going forward. Um, I'd like to take the, the same question over to Lisa and I want to build on something though that Dr. Lyle said. If you came from IBM, which really has a rich IP um, background experience, but in particular, how can we um, again, advice generally, but in particular to startups and other startups. I don't know if there's 
organizations that are around startups where, you know, somebody like your, you and your message about IP innovation, protecting it. If you're looking to, um, you know, take your innovation to the next level, I'd be curious what thoughts you have about that. Yeah, I think that the best way to get people to do it is to break it down. Any problem, any solution you're bringing to market is how do you make it really simple? And, and I'm obviously a tech worker who works remotely, so I'll share my screen again. But this is how I have people come up with patent ideas. It's a very, very simple document. You can see I'm in Google Drive here, but there's three sections. What's the background? What's the summary of your idea? What's the value to your company? And then a description of what the idea is. So just having people take a step back from thinking about patents and filing and claims and everything else that's complicated about it and making it easy to where you can write this up about anything, about you know why your dog runs away from its leash, right? Like any single problem that you're running into, how do you make it simple enough to where people can start solving the problem and then having something to compare and break down and do some prior art searching and figure out what else is out there. But once you get to this stage, then you bring in the experts, right? You talk to people who've done this before and get to that actual next step of creating a patent. Well, that's terrific. And streamlining the process and simplicity, I think, is, is the key first step to getting people to participate. Otherwise, you know, people may tend to think, I, I'm not an inventor, I haven't invented anything, or you know, the process is complicated. Um, you know, in our remaining time, I think I'll hand it over to Director Vidal to, um, you know, share any uh, advice uh, for the, the CHIPS organization here and, you know, uh, people, you know, in their practice and how they might encourage um, and accelerate the participation of women in innovation and creativity. Um, so over to you, Director Vidal. Thank, thank you, Noreen. And I have to say, this was so inspiring. And Dr. Lyle, Lisa, you are amazing. So, um, and obviously, Noreen, you as well. So thank, thank you for uh, inviting me to be on this. Uh, I leave all of these always so, um, so, so energized, including the chat. I mean, the chats, the level of engagement is just incredible. And that level of engagement is really what we need to move the needle. And the ability to figure out how we channel all that energy, all that engagement, into something that's actually gonna make a difference is really the challenge. And we're here to help with that challenge. We, um, I put my LinkedIn profile in there. I mean, feel free to connect up with me that way. You can email me at director at USPTO.gov. Um, Ruthie and Lisa, this is not gonna be the end of it. Ruthie, you already know that, but now Lisa, I'm just telling you as well that we have a lot to do together and you are amazing role models and we've got a lot of programming and we wanna make this really simple for people. We wanna be able to invite more people in show them how simple it is. I will say, um, I will end with one story that um, I saw an article recently about Thomas Edison. And I have, I don't know if you can see, I have Thomas Edison's first light bulb that he submitted to the USPTO on my desk, like the actual light bulb with his name that he put on it. And I say, you don't have to be Thomas Edison. And Thomas Edison wasn't even Thomas Edison. All he developed was an, an improved filament. He didn't invent the light bulb. And I think a lot of times, when people look at innovation and patenting, they think that what they have to come up with is something that's just breakthrough, incredible technology. That's great, but a lot of our patents, most of our patents are an improvement patent. So um, I, I, I wanna just make sure we're out there telling that story, helping people realize that if they have a solution to a problem they see in life, then there's IP there. It, it may be a patent, it may be a trade secret, it may be something that they can start a company and get a trademark, but we want people to see that there is access, bring more people in, um, circling back to the, uh, the theme today. Um, if we bring women in, and I will say, it's not just enough to bring you know, women in, we need to bring everybody who is not fully participating in the innovation ecosystem. If we bring them in, then we will accelerate, I'm, I'm quoting now from the IP day, accelerate innovation and creativity. When we do that, it's not only going to solve our world problems, um, it will increase our GDP by over a trillion dollars. Uh, it means jobs, food on the table, better paying jobs, putting your kids through college. Uh, this is so critical to the entire country, and I couldn't be more honored to be part of this process uh, and on this journey with you. Thank you so, so much uh, for your leadership. Um, thank you, Director Lyle and Lisa. And um, on behalf of CHIPS, uh, thank you all for participating on this call. 
And let's not have the conversation end here. Let's not have it end um, with this, this call or even this day that's focused on um, advancing and accelerating women invention. Let's keep the conversation going. Make connections with people who are, you know, you might've met in the chat. Um, connect with uh, the leadership of CHIPS and the folks on this call, the, the panelists, and let's let's keep the conversation going and, and keep the momentum going and not have this just be one day, um, one call. So thank you very much. And Monica, I will turn it back over to you to wrap things up. So thank you, everyone. Um, thank you all, Noreen, uh, Director Vidal, Dr. Lyle, Lisa DeLuca, a pleasure, truly.